This evening, John Ankerberg will examine what Roman Catholicism teaches concerning the doctrine of justification and what are the issues surrounding this doctrine that divide Catholics and Protestants today. The doctrine of justification deals with the question, how can a sinful person be accepted by a holy and righteous God? Catholicism carried to its logical conclusion is a denial of justification by faith in the context of Romans 4 and 5 uh, because it involves works as a means of merit. And where we disagree is precisely there because we, we understand the scriptures to also say that those obey, acts of obedience to the commandments are part of that process of justification the whole purpose of the John Ankerberg Show is for you to understand the issues clearly. So to help define terms and allow you to understand the tensions that exist to this day over the issue of justification between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, John Ankerberg will define key terms that represent what the Protestant reformers were teaching, and across from each of these points, key terms that represent Roman Catholicism's understanding of the doctrine of justification. John's guests are Father Mitchell Pacwa, an ordained Roman Catholic priest who is a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit. He has an earned Doctor of Philosophy degree and is currently a professor at Loyola University in Chicago. John's second guest is Protestant scholar Dr. Walter Martin, director and founder of the Christian Research Institute in California. Please join us for this discussion. Welcome. We're in the midst of a series of debate programs between Jesuit professor Father Mitchell Pacwa and Protestant scholar, the late Dr. Walter Martin, concerning the doctrines of Roman Catholicism. In the weeks to come, we're going to be debating papal infallibility, Catholicism's view of Mary, the mother of our Lord, confession, and purgatory. In this program, we're going to examine the doctrine of justification, the main issue that caused the Reformation and still divides Catholics and Protestants today. Only if you understand the terms surrounding this issue will you be able to come to a conclusion on the important topic, how can a sinful person be forgiven by a holy and righteous God? So, to define the main terms and issues, I'm going to set before you a chart containing five key terms that represents what the Protestant reformers were asserting, and then across from each of their points, another column of five key terms that represents the Roman Catholic understanding of the doctrine of justification. To begin, the first word on the Protestant side that describes what they mean by justification is the term forensic. Forensics has to do with speech. Maybe you were involved in a forensics club at school, so you know this term. The reason why Protestants label their position forensic justification is because their ultimate basis of justification is the spoken declaration of God. When God declares or pronounces that a sinful man is just, he is in fact just. The Protestant position is based on the scripture passage of Romans chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul appeals to Abraham to prove his point of justification by faith. Paul says that Abraham believed God when God made certain promises to him, and when Abraham believed God, as a result, God reckoned or imputed or credited to him, the same word, righteousness. That is, God declared Abraham's status to be as one who was at that moment standing righteous in God's sight. So for Luther and the Protestant reformers, the basis of Abraham's justification is found in God's declaration concerning Abraham that he pardoned or justified him the moment he believed. Forensic justification, then, is a declaration, an act that God does outside or apart from man. It is the judicial pronouncement of God about a sinful man that he, as a result of placing his faith in Christ, now stands before God having the status of justness. In brief, the sinful man has been officially declared pardoned by God. Now, the Roman Catholic Church considers forensic justification to be, as we can see in point number one on their side, a legal fiction. That is, this would involve God calling a man just when in and of himself the man is not just. This has its roots in the dispute stemming from Luther's very famous slogan, Simo Justus et peccatar, which means, at the same time, just and a sinner. What Luther meant by this was that when God sees that a man truly believes, 
he then declares that man justified legally in his sight. But at the same time, the pardoned sinner is still a sinner in and of himself. Catholicism objected to this, believing that God will not declare a man to be just until after a man works in cooperation with God's grace and has become just. In other words, God will not call an ashtray a rose. So Catholicism believes that the Protestant concept of forensic justification involves a very serious problem in the righteousness of God. Namely, it involves God in a legal fiction of calling someone just who in and of himself is not just. But this brings us to point number two, to get a broader understanding of what Protestants meant by forensic justification and why they said it did not involve God in a legal fiction, we need to look at the second word which describes their view. It is the word synthetic. Now by this term, the Protestant reformers meant there is a synthesis, a combining or adding of something to the sinner's account when he stands before God. Namely, the sinner appears before God in union with Christ. The biblical imagery says that the sinner appears clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That is, the righteousness, the merits of Christ, are given or imputed to him and cover him. God declares a sinner just not because he looks at the sinner's good deeds, but he declares him just in Christ. It's the unlimited merits of Christ stemming from Jesus' perfect life and his atoning death, which constitute a man righteous, not the merits of the man. Not to say that the merits of Christ are imputed, which is point number three underneath the Protestant side, means that the merits of Christ are reckoned, credited, counted, or transferred. It all means the same thing. Credited from the account of Jesus, so to speak, and placed over in the account of the sinner. The moment the sinner believes in Christ, God sees him standing in Christ, where all the riches and merits of Christ overwhelmingly cancel out the sinner's debts. The synthesis has taken place. That is, Christ and his merits have been added to the account of the sinner. The sinner offers and pleads nothing of his own before God, but everything that Christ has done for him. It is on the basis of the merits and riches of Christ alone, which are imputed to the sinner, that allows God to declare him justified or pardoned. Walter, are you saying this? If anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, are you saying that? Are I'm you saying that a man is justified by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ? Romans 4, absolutely. Okay. Trent says that man's anathema. Now, two across from synthetic on the Roman Catholic side is the word analytic which describes how they understand justification. The word analytic here means to analyze, to examine, to study in order to determine the outcome. Roman Catholicism believes that God declares a person just only after he analyzes the person and finds within the person real righteousness, real justness within. Now, how Catholicism says a person becomes truly righteous within is described by their word under point number three, which is the word infusion. By infusion, Catholicism teaches that God's prevenient grace, or the power of Christ, is infused or placed into the sinner. When this power is given and the sinner cooperates with this power, then he can arrive in a state of justness. And only then will God declare him to be just because he has in fact become just. Now, Catholicism is not teaching a crass view of justification that a man in and of himself can live a holy and righteous life and earn justification in the sight of God. But Catholicism is teaching that in the power of Christ, a man can arrive at a point where he will become just within and then God will be able to declare him justified. Whereas the Catholic Church is trying to say instead of imputation, it's rather a transformation of the inner person. That you have, and that's I, think, what I think we agree that the Catholic no Church problem. is saying that. Yeah, we yeah, and, that. And, okay. What we're saying is, is that what the Scripture exactly in Romans 3 and 4 is saying? If God is saying something different than Trent at that point, then we should stick with the Scripture. All right, let's summarize. Catholicism believes the basis of a man's justification is the righteousness which God finds within the person. For Protestantism, the basis of justification is Christ himself, his righteousness. In Protestantism, 
A man's righteousness within is not in any way the basis upon which God pardons a man. Rather, God pardons a man solely on the basis of Christ. In Catholicism, that which is called sanctification, or the inner transformation within a person, must come before a man can be justified. In Protestantism, sanctification, or the transformation of the person's inner life by the Holy Spirit, comes only as the immediate result of justification, and never is the means by which a man gains justification. Protestants believe Catholicism has not accepted Paul's teaching in Romans and Galatians where he clearly defines the only basis upon which God says he will justify a man. Notice what Paul says, To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, not those who are righteous within, his faith is reckoned, here's that word imputed or counted to him, as righteousness. Next, under number four on the Protestant side, we find the words, no human merit. By this, Protestants meant that man has no merit of his own whatsoever that can dispose God to justify him. Justification is not God's judgment based on the personal righteousness within the sinner or of any kind of good works a man can do, even in the power of Christ. Rather, justification is God's judgment based on the work of Christ at the cross in whom the sinner believes. The Bible says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known. And this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. The Apostle Paul emphatically states, It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Catholicism carried to its logical conclusion is a denial of justification by faith in the context of Romans 4 and 5 uh, because it involves works as a means of merit. The Roman Catholic doctrine itself teaches that man cooperates by faith and works for redemption, whereas biblical theology says it's by grace we have been saved through faith, not by ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, mm -hmm. lest anyone should boast. Not by anything working in you. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that. No transformation in you. Now, for across from the Protestant phrase, no human merit, is the Roman Catholic phrase, congruous merit. Catholicism teaches that working in cooperation with prevenient grace, or the infused power of Christ within a person, that the sinner can then live a life that is not absolutely perfect, but a life that is meritorious enough to make it congruous or fitting for God to grant him justification. In brief, a sinful man's cooperation with Christ's infused power can lead him to do good deeds that will earn him congruous merit before God. Now this is very important. Those good works done in the power of Christ which earn him congruous merit are necessary for salvation and must be present before justification takes place in Roman Catholicism. They are a condition for receiving a right standing before God that entails the promise of heaven. And where we disagree is precisely there because we, we understand the scriptures to also say that those obey, acts of obedience to the commandments are part of that process of justification. Now under number five, representing the views of Protestants, are the famous words, by faith alone. For Protestants, faith is not just intellectual assent to certain facts about Christ's salvation. Rather, faith is a knowledge of the facts, plus a total trust or resting of one's eternal destiny in Jesus Christ, who is the sole reason and grounds upon which God justifies us. For Protestants, justification is an act that can take place in a single moment, the moment the sinner, through faith, Trust Christ completely. At that moment, the benefits of Christ are applied to the sinner's life, and he is officially judged and declared by God to stand in his sight as righteous. For Protestants, the person's faith is not a meritorious work that contributes or helps provide justification. Rather, faith is only an instrument which allows a sinful person to reach out to Christ, and he is the sole reason, grounds, and basis upon which God justifies. Let me try to illustrate that. Picture a burning building and a person trapped on the third floor. When that person is urged to jump, 
to have faith that the firemen below will catch him in their net, if he jumps, it will not be the person's faith which saves him. Rather, it will be the net and the firemen holding the net who catch him. In salvation, it is not your faith which saves you. Rather, it is Christ who saves you. Our faith merely decides to allow Christ to rescue us, and it commits us into Christ's hands. To clearly see that faith in no way provides the basis of our salvation, answer this. How much do you think your faith would save you if after you jumped off the third floor, on the way down, you discovered the firemen were only standing in a circle and they weren't holding any net? Well, at that point, it'd be very clear that your faith can't do anything to save you. What you need is a real net with real firemen holding it. The same is true spiritually. It's not your faith that actually provides your salvation. Rather, it is Christ who paid for all your sins on the cross, and He has the strength to do all the saving. Faith is nothing more than your decision. You're exercising your free will to ask Christ to save you. Why should anyone think that your decision to ask Christ to save you, your placing your faith in Him, actually helps Him to save you? Now, five across from faith alone is Catholicism's belief that justification is by faith plus works. For Catholicism, faith is required, but they object to saying that faith alone is all that God requires for Him to justify a person. In addition to faith, Catholicism also requires works. But at the same time, as St. James says, faith alone is not enough. Faith without good works is insufficient. Because the justification that the Catholic Church talks about is not, as Luther taught, merely imputed. Now, the dispute centers on some key passages in the New Testament, most notably the third and fourth chapters of Romans and the second chapter of the Epistle of James. Let's look at these passages right now. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 28, says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Protestants believe that since Paul says that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, then one can only conclude justification must be by faith alone. There are no other options. Further, Paul's own conclusion in chapter 5 is, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. In Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul builds his case for justification by faith without works by giving a historical example where he appeals to the case of Abraham. He begins, For if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Here again, you'll find the word reckoned means to count, to impute, to place to the account of Abraham. After stating this about Abraham, Paul argues, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. Notice once again, that according to Paul, God justifies the ungodly not the ones righteous within. Paul says his faith is reckoned, or imputed, as righteousness. Now what Paul very clearly says here is that when Abraham believed God, that was the time of his justification. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God, and he was justified by divine declaration apart from works. So here in chapter 4, the Apostle Paul links the statement from chapter 3 we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law, with the historical situation of Abraham to prove his case that a man is declared justified by God the moment he believes. Paul labors the point that it is by faith alone in Christ and nothing of man's works that is the basis of God's justifying a man. Now, how does the Roman Catholic Church deal with this? Well, they counter this concept of justification by faith alone by an appeal to James chapter 2, verse 24, where it reads, You see, then, that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, Roman Catholic scholars say to Protestants, Can the Bible make it any clearer? Here you are, going around, teaching that justification is by faith alone, and yet we have a statement right from the Apostle James that says, 
You see then that justification is by works and not by faith alone. And what's more, not only does James say that justification is by works and not by faith alone, but he appeals to Abraham to prove his point, the very historical figure that the Apostle Paul appealed to in stating his case of justification by faith in Romans 4. Now, does this mean that we have an irreconcilable contradiction between the two apostles? Are they teaching different doctrines? No. As we'll see next week during our debate, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans is talking about how a man is justified before God, whereas the Apostle James is talking about how a man is justified before men. James is answering the question, how can we tell what is a true and genuine faith? His answer is, if a man says he has faith but has no works, that kind of faith is not a real faith. That's a dead faith. And Luther and the Reformers would agree. They said, works do not bring justification, but they do grow out of it. Works are the fruit, the results, the evidence that shows that a man has a genuine faith. So, the two apostles are in agreement. There is no contradiction. James is not talking about works bringing a man into a relationship with God. He knows that justification before God only comes by true faith in Christ. What James is saying is since men cannot see another person's heart, as God can, to judge whether or not that person has true faith, the only thing that men can see is a person's works. But a genuine faith will always result in producing good works. Therefore, in this sense, works can justify a person before other men, but not before God. Works show that there is a genuine faith present. And that's why James cites Abraham's good works as the proof that Abraham had genuine faith. While the Apostle Paul cites Abraham to prove that Abraham was justified before God the moment he believed, and no works were involved. In brief, James is saying, if people want to test whether or not the faith that justifies a man before God, that the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans, is really in a person, the only way they can check this is by looking at the results that flow from a true faith, namely a person's works. So it's works that justify a man's claim to faith in front of people, but it's faith alone in Christ that justifies a man before God. Next week, I hope that you'll join me to hear how Father Pacwa and Dr. Martin debate this further. For additional resources, log on to jashow.org. That's jashow.org. 